Welcome to the New Monastics Podcast, where we'll be discussing all aspects of the contemplative life and interspirituality in the context of modernity. On each episode, we will choose a topic to explore with one of today's leading teachers or thinkers. The New Monastics Podcast is a project of Caris Foundation for New Monasticism and Interspirituality, which is dedicated to the emergence of a newly conceived contemplative life of embodied spirituality and sacred activism. Welcome to the New Monastics Podcast. I'm Natanel, co-founder of Caris Foundation and dialogue partner for our guests. And I'm Daniel, the host for the show. Today, we have my good friend, Rabbi Or Rose, a scholar of Hasidism and Neo-Hasidism, deeply involved in interreligious dialogue. Today, he is the director of the Miller Center for Interreligious Learning and Leadership at Hebrew College in Boston. Welcome, Or. We're so happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you both. Great. Thank you. So as Natanel mentioned, you're the director of the Miller Center for Interreligious Learning and Leadership at Hebrew College. Can you tell us a little bit about what that role entails and what a current area of focus for the Miller Center is, and maybe just a little bit more about your general role at Hebrew College outside of the Miller Center? Sure. I am actually in the midst of my 20th year at Hebrew College. Wow. Wow. It is essentially the only job that I've had as an adult, (laughs) (laughs) and I continue to love it. Hebrew College, which is located in Newton, Massachusetts, is a non-denominational or pluralistic Jewish institution. And so that means that uh, we welcome students from various walks of Jewish life. I came there 20 years ago with my mentor, Rabbi Arthur Green, to create a rabbinical school. And uh, it was the first non-denominational or pluralistic rabbinical school that was also accredited. And that rabbinical school has grown beautifully over the last two decades. One of the gifts of being a part of Hebrew College was that when I arrived, we were situated next door, cheek to jowl, with Andover Newton Theological School, which at the time was the oldest independent Christian seminary in the country. And so given the proximity between the two schools, I was quickly invited into a series of interfaith or interreligious activities that were informal at the outset. And from that set of experiences, we began to build various programming initiatives together that eventually led to the Miller Center. The Miller Center is now in its seventh year, and uh, in that capacity, we focus most of our attention on leadership development. So we try and help people at different life stages advance as interreligious leaders in training. And among the foci at present are small and intensive fellowship groups for high school students, undergraduates, and for graduate students. So I, I didn't know that, uh, uh, how you came into this role. Did you have an interest in interreligious things, you know, prior to that? I did. You might say <laughs> that it came with mother's milk. <laughs> <laughs> and Nitano yeah. actually knows my parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so literally. <laughs> Which means to say that my parents were students of Reb Zalman's. And as a part of the ethos of what became Jewish renewal was a strong commitment to interfaith or interreligious engagement. So I grew up with that as a priority in my thickly Jewish home. I do want to say that professionally, one turning point for me, which is not at all unusual for people our age, (laughs) was 9-11. I was a grad student at the time at Brandeis, And I was working part-time at a local Jewish day school. And it fell on me and other faculty people at this community day school to share with children as young as six years old what was happening. And that experience, not only the horrible 
tragedy of 9-11 itself, but then working with the school to unpack the various religious, cultural, political dimensions of the terrorist attack and various responses to it awakened me to the urgent need for more people in religious leadership roles to be involved interreligiously, cross-culturally. And that began to leaven, (laughs) I would say. And so when I had the opportunity to start working on this uh, with greater vocational focus, I was excited and um, I felt called. And you, you brought up Reb Zalman, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, the founder of Jewish Renewal. And in his work, he made a kind of language shift from purely interreligious dialogue to something he called deep ecumenism. Can you speak a little bit about that and what the difference is between interreligious dialogue and deep ecumenism in terms of orientation and practice? Sure. I think when talking about Reb Zalman, at the core of all of his interreligious work, of his ecumenical passions, was a love of people. (laughs) And so he was a kind of religious explorer who wanted to understand firsthand and first head and first heart (laughs) how other religious seekers went about their quests for the holy. And rather than engaging in what he considered mostly to be overly formal public dialogues or theological diatribes, he really wanted to be involved with people asking the essential question, as Nathaniel knows well, how do I move from my is to my ought? Mm -hmm. And if there was someone who was willing to have that conversation and to do so in an open manner that allowed for questions and for uncertainties and for the anxiety both of similarity and difference, he loved it Mm -hmm. uh, and lived into it in quite beautiful ways. And for me, uh, that is a piece of Reb Zalman's legacy that I try and carry with me every day in my work. It really is a part of what we would call in Hebrew his Yerusha, you know, the inheritance that he has bequeathed that really matters greatly to me. And so I would use another term to help illustrate what I'm speaking about. And that actually comes from one of Reb Zalman's colleagues at Temple University, Professor Len Swidler. Len who was really one of the founders of the American and then international dialogue movement post-Second World War, post the Second Vatican Council in 1962 through 65, says dialogue is a term that's too squishy sometimes. And so he says really what we should be thinking about is dialogue in three realms, a dialogue of the head, a dialogue of the heart, in the dialogue of the hands. And I was alluding to that before, so I want to name it in Len's name because I think that's very helpful. And different people are drawn to different forms of these kinds of dialogical encounters, and all of them are needed. I think in Reb Zalman's case, he found that in academic and other official contexts, people were most interested in the dialogue of the head. And then he saw, too, that there was an important growth, you know, Uh, in the grassroots movement in terms of civic engagement and social services, social justice activities, and Reb Zalman also being the consummate davener, a person of prayer, really wanted to engage in heart-centered conversations, including, so what is it that you might be experiencing as, you know, you hold these prayer beads in hand? Mm -hmm. Or what might you be experiencing as you blow this whistle made of animal bone, etc.? I'll pause there because there's so much more to say, and I'm sure uh, the three of us can take it deeper. (laughs) 
Well, it just immediately brings up for me what Reb Zalman would say of himself as characterizing himself as a playfully as a spiritual peeping Tom and saying, yes. I want to see how people <laughs> get it on with God. And it seems in that way that maybe as a correction to this kind of imbalance you were speaking to of being overly head focused, it seems like Reb Zalman's focus was even more so on this dialogue of the heart and the dialogue of the hands and was really interested in practice. And how does yes. one practice with somebody of another tradition and maybe how can we share deep contemplative space or revelatory space together even in different traditions and it seems like from his life he had different opportunities to experience that directly which seems like it inherently informed his later kind of teaching on these subjects and so as we're kind of broaching into this i'm curious to ask about two people from different religious traditions, in this case, both Christians, who I know you have a kind of particular focus on, which is Thomas Merton and Howard Thurman, who Reb Zalman had a special relationship with each of them. And I'm wondering if you can just speak a little bit to that relationship and your interest in the relationship between Reb Zalman and these two kind of spiritual giants. Yes, happy to do so. I may be one of the few people that learned about these Christian luminaries through Reb Zalman and not through <laughs> the works of these two people themselves. But um, that is a part of the legacy of these interreligious pioneers. They open worlds to us. So let me start with Howard Thurman, who was, as the two of you know, an African-American spiritual teacher, pastoral care provider, public speaker, activist, and Reb Zalman encountered him in 1955 when Thurman was already a veteran educator and public figure at Boston University School of Theology. And Thurman served uh, for Zalman, I would say, as the first model, Jewish or not, of a non-Orthodox spiritual figure hmm. that Zalman had no choice but to take very seriously. He said when he encountered Howard Thurman that he had to redraw his reality map. <laughs> and after a year of study with Thurman, as Natanel knows well, Reb Zalman described him as his Rebbe, as his Black or African-American Rebbe, which for a still young and up-and-coming Chassid is quite the declaration. And Reb Zalman considered Thurman to be his Rebbe throughout the rest of Reb Zalman's life. And one sign of the, of the respect that Reb Zalman had for Thurman, speaking of dialogues of the heart, is that in his book Davening, which um, Reb Zalman wrote towards the end of his life, Reb Zalman dedicates it to two of his Chabad Lubavitch teachers and to Howard Thurman. So Thurman, you know, is one giant. And uh, pivoting from Thurman to Merton, one might say if Thurman was Reb Zalman's Protestant <laughs> Rebbe, then Merton was his Catholic Chavruta, <laughs> or older peer and friend. Mm -hmm. And Zalman being Zalman, he decided after reading Merton and loving Merton's spiritual prose, that they should be friends. <laughs> and so through an intermediary, that is one of Reb Zalman's students who was in the Cincinnati area at the time, he met Merton, and they became beloved companions for almost a decade. And Reb Zalman made pilgrimage, and I mean that with the full weight of that term, at least once. And Natanel and I are trying to do some detective work to figure out just how many times he visited Merton at Gethsemane in Kentucky. And they had a beautiful relationship about exactly what we were speaking about earlier, which is about praxis, about what it means to be a religious person, what it means to be a religious person in a modern context, what it means to try and live into one's commitments 
and to do so carrying with them both the wisdom of the ages, but also being responsive to the needs of the hour. And, um, you know, Reb Zalman had this intensive Christian period, as he called it, <laughs> in which he fell in love very deeply, both with uh, Protestantism and Catholicism, but again, through encounters with people, flesh and blood, people that were living embodiments of these traditions, not abstractions, not dogmas, not about simply reading textbooks, though, of course, Reb Zalman was a voracious reader. I would agree. Um, as much as he read, and you know, and over the years I would learn what a remarkable amount he had read, as much as he read, his relationship was not with Catholicism as a subject, or Christianity as a subject, or Islam as a subject, though he had fascination with those things, it was always with people. It was always in direct relationship to people. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an important distinguishing feature of his ecumenism. Mm. It wasn't intellectual. He was a brilliant intellect, but it was not intellectual. So I have two kind of directions I'm wanting to go from here, which is one, or you use the word Rebbe. And I'm wondering if you can provide some context for that sure. term, as specifically yes. as it relates to Reb Zalman and Hasidism. Sure. So Hasidism, from the root word chesed, which means a number of things in Hebrew. Hebrew is a language with fewer words than English, but each of those words has multiple meanings mm -hmm. oftentimes. And so chesed can mean love. Chesed can mean mercy. Chesed can also mean a love or a mercy that leads to a certain kind of dedication that we would refer to in Western religious terms as piety. So a number of groups over the centuries have been called Hasidim. Mm -hmm. And the Hasidim, for pronouncing it with an Eastern European accent, that we are referring to are the Hasidim that emerged on the scene in what we would now refer to as Ukraine, beginning sometime in the 1740s, 50s, and 60s. And it was, at first, a small, loosely knit group of mystical seekers. At the center of that group stood a great healer and teacher named Israel, the son of Eliezer, known as the Baal Shem Tov. And he was a folk healer. And he was a practical mystic mm -hmm. who used herbal remedies and incantations and led intensive prayer groups and so forth. It was a popular movement. You might describe it as a revival movement of medieval Jewish mysticism, which is called in Hebrew Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. And so Reb Zalman was actually born into one Hasidic dynasty, but then right in his childhood and adolescence, was mostly raised as what we refer to as a modern Orthodox Jew and didn't have great exposure to Hasidism. But then as a teen, as he and his family, sadly, were on the run from the Nazis, encountered a remarkable group of Chabad Hasidim. Chabad is an acronym that describes one particular dynasty or school of Hasidic thought, and Zalman fell in love with this group of diamond cutters and polishers, and mm -hmm. uh, he describes this remarkable experience in Antwerp, in which this group of men would whistle while they worked, <laughs> but in a mystical key, in a poetic key, in a literary key, where they would study the works of Jewish mystics and of European poets and literary figures, and it spoke to several of Reb Zalman's sensibilities at once. First of all, he loved to roll up his sleeves and to create, mm -hmm. and he loved um, to engage with things that were beautiful, and to do so with hands and heart and head. In fact, he describes one of the people, the leader of the group, actually reading 
you know, over the, the noise of the carving and polishing, whether it was a text from the founder of Chabad Lubavitch, Nirzaman of Liadi, or it was a modern French or German poet, it just delighted Reb Zalman. And I think that it spoke to him about the possibility of spiritual, intellectual, and embodied integration. And he carried that experience with him into his adulthood, and it became a model for him. It really was a touchstone for everything that he did thereafter. Mm -hmm. So the term Rebbe is usually reserved for a spiritual master that a chassid has within an exclusively Jewish context. And Reb Zalman had several teachers or masters that he was very close with, most significantly the sixth Rebbe of Lubavitch, whom he met in New York. So to call Howard Thurman, a person that in so many ways was an other, a Rebbe, is a remarkable statement about the impression that Thurman made on Reb Zalman and Reb Zalman's capacity to embrace that which is beautiful, that which is inspiring, that which he felt was needed in the world. Uh, and again, it was through this dialogical relationship. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make that clear in terms of the kind of exceptional nature of Reb Zalman relating to Howard Thurman as a Rebbe, and then also just clarify that Reb Zalman at this time was a practicing chassid in the lineage of Chabad and had emigrated to New York and had gone through a whole rabbinical training and then was yes. operating as a rabbi in the Hasidic lineage of Chabad. And so right. the other direction I wanted to go to is on a previous episode, we'd actually told the story of Reb Zalman arriving at Gethsemane Abbey and ringing yes. the bell and having this kind of I beautiful <laughs> interreligious counter. And given that, I wanted to open up space for Natanel to share a story that I've heard him share multiple times, which is Reb Zalman's encounter with Howard Thurman. So if you'd be willing, I'm wondering if you can give a taste of that initial encounter that kind of led to this lifelong friendship and discipleship in a lot of ways. Well, yeah. Um, Reb Zalman at that time uh, was finding that he really wanted to understand the technology of helping people. Mm -hmm. How am I going to be effective in helping people? And so he became interested, and he was probably among the, the first uh, Chabad outreach workers to seek other degrees and um, other education to support their activity. But he decided he wanted to study pastoral psychology. And at that time, you could do such a thing at uh, Boston University. And so he would make the drive down, and this is relevant, he, he'd have to get up pretty early, actually not down, I, I think <laughs> maybe up, and make the drive to Boston University. And he'd get there very early uh, so that he could attend classes. And having gotten up so early, he had the problem of finding a place to pray. There's a chapel, of course, <laughs> but full of, you know, rather large crosses and so on. Is it a place where an Orthodox Jew can pray? And he really didn't quite feel uh, comfortable there. So he'd gotten himself into, I think, uh, what was called the Daniel Marsh uh, memorabilia room, <laughs> which is probably off the Daniel Marsh chapel. Is that right? Or It is. <laughs> And so he was doing his davening in there. Davening is a, is a word that is used within Hasidism for not just prayer, which can be done perfunctorily, but prayer in which one is deeply involved. And so Hasidim will, will talk about davening. Mm -hmm. And so he looked for a room in which he could do his davening in the morning. He ends up praying in this memorabilia room. <laughs> and one day a man passes the door and looks in on him here, an Orthodox Jew, uh, praying in the memorabilia room. And it's a black man. And he asks, you know, why is it that you don't pray in the, in the chapel? 
And Reb Zalman, looking at a black man in the 1950s, mid-1950s, admittedly said that he assumed that perhaps he was talking to the janitor. And I think that's an important assumption to own at, at the time. And he kind of mumbled a, a kind of reply about, you know, crosses and so on, you know, but he wasn't going to get into a dialogue about it. Nevertheless, the man to whom he's speaking, an older man, says, next time, try the chapel. And so, Reb Zalman, curious person that he is, when he comes back to pray the next time, he looks into the chapel and discovers that the very large brass cross has been set aside and covered over. And the rather large Bible that is out is now open to the Psalms, the Psalm which says, Whither shall you flee from my presence? Meaning, where are you going to go where God is not present? There's nowhere to hide from God. And seeing the cross set aside, he now knew that he had permission to pray in this room, and when he prayed in there, to set the cross aside. And then he'd when he was done davening, he turned the psalms to a thank you psalm. <laughs> and turns out, this is Howard Thurman. And that's his initial meeting with him, not knowing that he's Howard Thurman. A little later, he finds in the course catalog a course called uh, Spiritual Disciplines and Resources with Labs, he would always point out. <laughs> it was a spiritual course that had labs, much as you might have a, a chemistry lab to go with your chemistry class. Got very excited about this, but saw that it was taught by a Christian minister. And in those days, you, you could not be assured that, uh, that you weren't going to be preached at, preached to, or, or that the minister might not attempt to convert you. And so he had possible issues with taking this class. So he made an appointment with the professor to explain his position as an Orthodox Jew. When he showed into the room, there is the janitor. Not the janitor at all, uh, but the Dean of Marsh Chapel at Boston University, which was very significant in that time. The Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman had been invited to, into such a role in the mid-1950s mm -hmm. in the United States. And of course, he teaches courses, and he's teaching this course, Spiritual Disciplines and Resources. And so that is the moment where Reb Zalman met Howard Thurman as Howard Thurman. And a little extension of the story uh, is that he now is somewhat embarrassed, but also has to explain, and because there's no assurance that, you know, that a black Christian minister isn't going to try to convert you either, has to explain that he's an Orthodox Jew who is curious about these things, but does not want to be converted. And Reb Zalman phrased it in an interesting manner, which may have been a personal revelation. Important that he said, you know, I want to take this course, but I don't know if my anchor chains are strong enough. Or he may have said long enough. I can't remember. Or, <laughs> <laughs> which is to say, I don't, I have some worries about getting unmoored, you know, mm -hmm. disturbed in my faith. Which meant it was possible. So it's, I think it's telling that, uh, that he put it this way. And Thurman, you know, to my mind, famously, because these stories are <laughs> <laughs> part of my own Hasidism, <laughs> our neo-Hasidism, did not answer him right away, but was quiet and held up his hands above his desk, palms up, and then began to turn them back and forth looking at the top of his hand and at the palm, back and forth, back and forth. And Reb Zalman said it was almost interminable. He'd like, <laughs> uh, he was getting stressed by <laughs> the silence. And he said as, as if he was considering the light and dark sides of an argument, the top of his hands darker, the, the bottom of his hands lighter. And finally Thurman spoke, and he said this, Don't you trust the Ruach HaKodesh? Don't you trust the Holy Spirit? Meaning, if you're led by inspiration somewhere, and you're in real relationship with God and with the Holy Spirit, what do you have? You know, like, you trust or you don't. And if it led you here, perhaps you should trust that. 
But hearing the Hebrew spoken from a Christian minister so shook Reb Zalman that he said he pretty much jumped out of his chair, thanked Thurman very <laughs> quickly, and ran out of the room. And he said for the next week or two, he was in an existential crisis. Mm-hmm. Do not do I trust the Ruch HaKodesh? And there can only be one answer to that question for a real practitioner. You know, I must. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's the, the fuller story of that first encounter and Thurman becoming his Black Rebbe, as he said. Mm. It's interesting you uh, decided to share that story today because I just got a an email from Professor Walter Flucker, who's one of the preeminent scholars of Howard Thurman's life and thought about the publication of a volume called The Unfinished Search for Common Ground, Reimagining Howard Thurman's Life and Work. And in that volume, I contributed an essay called uh, Interreligious Hospitality, Howard Thurman and Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi, where I share that story and try and analyze different dimensions of it, because I think it really can be an important teaching tool in the interreligious realm. So, Daniel, with your permission, can I just remark on two or three elements of that story that I think are by all means, absolutely <laughs> important? One, just to go back to the beginning and clarify, the reason Reb Zalman couldn't pray before he left home is because it was still dark out. <laughs> and so one is not permitted to pray the morning service, literally called the dawn service, shachrit, unless there is enough light, as discussed by the ancient rabbis, to pray. So he took his prayer shawl and his prayer boxes, his talis and tefillin in hand, and at least as Reb Zalman tells it, no other building on campus was open. <laughs> and <laughs> I ask myself mischievously, <laughs> was that the case or was this offbeat <laughs> chassid just curious enough <laughs> to want to see what was happening inside <laughs> of Marsh Chapel, which stands at the center of the Boston University campus, which is to say, Reb Zalman even crossing the threshold of that building, let alone going into, you know, the sanctuary or a smaller prayer space, was already transgressive in some ways um, vis-a-vis his Chabad community. Because of the history of Jewish-Christian relations, it was frowned upon, to say the least, even to open the door and go inside, even if you were only going to pray in the memorabilia room. So whether it was the only building open or not, there's something about Reb Zalman's curiosity that's already displayed by the simple fact that he entered the building. Mm -hmm. The other thing which I I do want to say is that much of that story is animated by nonverbal communication. The ways in which Thurman sees Reb Zalman and has the sensitivity to understand, based on what Netanel rightly described as a kind of murmuring, <laughs> embarrassed response, that he needed to do something to help this person who clearly was out of their element. And so, lo and behold, without saying anything, he reorganizes right the small chapel in the basement and Zalman is just amazed by these acts of generosity. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I love Reb Zalman's growing ecumenical or interreligious sensibility so that when he leaves, you know, with a wink, <laughs> he blows out the candles, first of all, which Thurman <laughs> lit for him so that he doesn't burn down the place. But then... <laughs> He also returns the big brass cross that was at the front of the room back to its place because for the rest of the day, it is a Christian worship space. And that to me is also important. It's a reciprocation, an embodied reciprocation. And then the touch, which is so delicious of turning the Psalms 
from Psalm 139 to 100, it's like sealing it with a kiss. Just <laughs> communicating, you know, through text, through other sacred objects without having to say anything directly. And that to me is also a very important lesson for us. And then when we get to the office, the exchange is fascinating. First of all, as Nathaniel said, that the Reb Zalman is embarrassed and embeds that embarrassment into his narrative about this encounter, which he told in three or four different books, you know, over several decades, is significant. So that we as the readers also own our biases. You never know who just might become your Rebbe. <laughs> And then also, um, I do want to say that Thurman, again, with wisdom and experience, seems to intuit what kind of response is going to be appropriate for this man. Because if it were somebody else answering him with, do you trust the Holy Spirit, and saying that in Hebrew may have been overwhelming, may have been understood as being manipulative, mm -hmm. but it worked, you know? So this pair somehow worked, teacher and student, Rebbe and Chassid, mentor and mentee. So the dynamics are fascinating. And then the other thing I just want to point out as it relates to power, because that's an important part of the story, here are two men who both experienced in very different ways the cruelties of bigotry. And I'm sure that as their relationship evolved, that was an important connector. I have seen no evidence of them actually discussing it, right, explicitly or at any length. But both understood what it meant to feel like they lived, if you will, at different points in time in the shadow of the cross. Because remember that Thurman was the grandchild of a slave, and in Daytona Beach, Florida, he literally saw the Klan burning crosses on front lawns. And Reb Zalman, of course, very narrowly escaped the brutality of the Nazis. And so here was this interesting pair. And then even further, you know, the dynamics here around race and religion, age, comfort level at this university – you know, all things for us to consider when we think about our own interreligious engagements. And when do we serve as host? And when do we serve as guest? Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that a few years later, Reb Zalman had the opportunity to reciprocate and be the host. So in 1963, when he's a budding professor and Hillel director at the University of Manitoba in Canada, he arranges for his teacher to come and lecture. And they have this wonderful mystical adventure <laughs> together. But he has the opportunity to welcome Thurman. And Thurman graciously accepts and was very moved by the experience. You know, one of the highlights of that experience together is that Reb Zalman asks Thurman to bless his son. One of his sons was celebrating his bar mitzvah. And so he asks Thurman if... He would bless his son in a way that is reminiscent to anyone that's even vaguely familiar with Hasidism, to how a Hasid might ask a Rebbe to bless the son of a Hasid, you know, before a bar mitzvah. And then even more interesting <laughs> is that Reb Zalman says to Thurman, I want you to come and sit in my office at the University of Manitoba. And Thurman sits down and he says, it's very hard to describe this office <laughs> because there are all kinds of religious paraphernalia, you know, ancient and modern. And right in front of Reb Zalman's desk, facing his desk, is a big painting of the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, of his master. And there is Thurman sitting at Reb Zalman's desk, as he's been requested to do, looking at the sixth Rebbe. And Zalman says, now I want you to close your eyes. Now that you can see where I work daily, I want you to take it in and I want you to take this feeling back with you to Boston so that when you're in Boston, you can think of me and you can bless me from a distance. 
a remarkable kind of moment. Clearly, that grew out of the depths of this relationship, and you can see you know, how it grew from that initial story. And by the way, both men were consummate storytellers. <laughs> so their own lives became the subjects of their Jewish and Christian stories, and they became characters in their stories, and those stories became teaching tools. So it's really just wonderful. This notion of guest and host is one of the things to me that's most significant, and that we need to play both, you know, in, term, in terms of the dynamics of, of growth and transformation. If you're enjoying the episode, please consider subscribing to our Patreon to help support the production of the podcast. Subscriptions begin at $1. All patrons receive access to bonus content, curated resources, and exclusive patron events, including live Q&As. For more information, please check out the Patreon link in the show notes, and thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you. I had no idea we were going to get such a deep dive into the Howard Thurman, Reb Zalman encounter, but <laughs> maybe it's the best way to kind of highlight this principle of deep ecumenism, I think what's very obvious, at least from Reb Zalman's part, because I just want to acknowledge we have less information about how Howard Thurman was impacted by Reb Zalman rather than vice versa. Right. Although Thurman did write this very detailed report about the second encounter, and uh, at one point was going to include it in his own memoir, but didn't, but very generously, um, Fluker and uh, his um, research partner, Peter Eisenstadt, shared with me that document from the, from the Thurman archive. And it's a very detailed step-by-step -step account of, of their journey, including another wonderful detail, which is Reb Zalman comes to pick up Thurman from the train station because Thurman did not like to travel by plane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he, uh, he picks him up. And one of the first things that Howard Thurman notices about um, Reb Zalman's car is that he has a little bell attached, um, you know, to the uh, to the mirror, and so he asks him as they go over one bump and then another and then another, <laughs> why do you have that bell? And Reb Zalman says, "I have it there um, so that every time that it rings, I remember that I'm not quite as good as I think I am or I should be." <laughs> And it really is a kind of summons, right? Um, it, it's a call to attention. And I just imagine it as a kind of modern equivalent of the Baal Shem Tov's horse-drawn <laughs> carriage. And the Baal Shem Tov, you know, going along on his adventures and every bump and every click, right, saying, right, oh, yes, I'm in the presence of God. <laughs> and if one could do that in, in Meserish, in the Ukraine, why not, you know, in the Canadian prairies? <laughs> yeah, and until that that came out, you know, about the, the, the bell in Thurman's report, I thought that that was a later um, uh, thing that, you know, a, a, a minhag of Reb Zalman's, a, a custom that I thought came late in his life. So when I would drive around with him in his uh, Montero, <laughs> <laughs> Part of the, the memory of that experience of all those drives together is the ringing of that little bell. Mm. You know, you hit a bump and there's, <laughs> there's this little ringing that is always happening in there. He drove a little fast and it was a little bumpy, <laughs> <laughs> so it rang a lot. <laughs> and I remember asking him, what, what's the bell? And, and he told me, you know, very similarly that, that it's, it's, a, it's a consciousness tool. It's a means of remembering to remember. Yes. And often he'll whisper a little blessing every time he hit that bump and that bell rang. <laughs> but right up until the end, you know, so this is, you know, for, you know from the 60s uh, through his, his passing in 2014, mm. there was a bell in the car. <laughs> and a notepad. There was always a little notepad <laughs> to jot down his thoughts. Right. It's interesting. He once reported to Merton going, you know, from Thurman back to Merton, that he would also keep a list of people for whom he wanted to say blessings, mm -hmm. the Misha Berach blessing, the blessing for healing. And 
And he wrote Merton in a moment of vulnerability and honesty when he felt quite frenzied at some point in 1963 or 1964 saying, I'm so busy these days trying to do, you know, God's work that I find that I don't have the time or the attention to actually even recite the names of the people on this list that I keep in my car, you know, that I'm so busy being busy, (laughs) you know, being quote unquote, as he said, God's errand boy, (laughs) (laughs) that I don't have time for the kind of prayer that I was trained (laughs) to do. And so it's it's an interesting glimpse into the life of a practitioner in real time who's actually struggling you know, what does it mean to be a religious professional? Yeah. And how does one actually continue to be a religious practitioner while being a religious professional, mm-hmm. you know, f- from that same automobile? <laughs> yeah, and the car later did always have a list of a few names. And I wondered, well, what are the names for? But in those years, um, before he passed, he also kept uh, a little photo box Mm. on the floor next to the the chair in which he prayed. He used to stand to pray at a stender, you know, at a a prayer stand. And then later, as he got much older, he'd pray in his chair that rocked. And next to the chair was a photo box with all these photos of these people that he prayed for, Mm. uh, often with their names and their mother's name written on them. Because, you know, when you're going to pray for somebody uh, among Jews, you you want to connect to that particular soul. So it's mm-hmm. them and their mother's name. And that box probably had, um, I don't know, 500 pictures in it. And mm. and he would just kind of file through it, you know, praying for as many as I, he could or sometimes looking for the faces that called out to him. Mm. Yeah, and I, th- I think with that said, it's still really clear this kind of deep ecumenical perspective in terms of the relationship was not superficial and that at least I'm much more familiar with Howard Thurman's impact upon Reb Zalman rather than the reverse. And it's very Mm -hmm. clear that it was transformative in in numerous ways. And so I think it's a helpful kind of illustration of the principle in general. And as you noted, or it's not without different kinds of challenging dynamics of power and privilege, yes. black, white, Christian, Jewish, all different kinds of things. And that is something for us to learn, you know, that those dialogues and encounters don't happen once we're completely clear and open of any of our biases and assumptions. But it's, I think, for right. each person to take responsibility for their assumptions and biases and have an honest dialogue and an honest encounter and can we kind of touch into that common ground? And as Howard Thurman was speaking about it, and I just Mm -hmm. want to name, we referenced Howard Thurman's memoir, which is wonderful. And so for anyone who's interested, that book is called With Head and Heart, the Autobiography of Howard Thurman, and is really a wonderful read for people who are interested. So now we've, we've talked a little bit about interreligious dialogue and deep ecumenism, as well as Reb Zalman and Hasidism and Natanel dropped the word that I would like for us to jump off of, which is neo Hasidism. Mm-hmm. And so you provide a little bit of context earlier about Hasidism as a historical evolution within Judaism and more specifically as a movement of Jewish mysticism. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about this neo in front of Hasidism. <laughs> what exactly does that mean? And I know that you're a student of Arthur Green, who probably along with Reb Zalman are two of the kind of modern figures who have been yes. the most major in terms of explicating a quote unquote neo Hasidism. And yet, just like anything that doesn't have a universal meaning, not everyone who identifies as a neo Hasid has a similar understanding or similar practice. And so especially given Hasidism in many ways is a very insular and kind of closed world that many people will not necessarily have great context for. I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about this. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Happily. So at the beginning of the 20th century, 
there emerged a number of literary and religious figures that were drawn to Hasidism and different elements of the Hasidic tradition, but were not a part of formal Hasidic communities. Some of them may have been in their youth, but chose to leave and to modernize, and others were not. So the most famous among the early cultural and spiritual neo-Hasidic figures was Martin Buber. Buber, of course, who was the author of, of the great theological, philosophical work, I and Thou, was the first great interpreter of Hasidic stories for a Western audience. First, right, in German, then in Hebrew and in English. And so that's an example of, right, a cultural, spiritual, neo-Hasidic figure. We could also point to a figure like Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was born into a Hasidic family, a family that was quite highly regarded because Heschel came from several generations of prominent Hasidic leaders or rebbes. He decided as a teen to leave that more insular world of traditional Hasidism, but continued to carry with him what he considered to be, you know, the most significant teachings and traditions of Hasidism. And again, you know, served as a bridge figure and a translator in the broadest sense of certain Hasidic ideas and sensibilities to a North American audience. And Buber and Heschel are now understood, of course, as being pillars in this neo-Hasidic world. Reb Zalman you know, had the opportunity to learn mostly informally from Heschel, who was a teacher and an older friend. I believe that he met Buber at one point, but wasn't close with Buber in the ways in which he became close with Heschel. And uh, Reb Zalman, along with uh, his friend from his yeshiva experience, you know, in Chabad Lubavitch in New York, from his training as a Chabad Lubavitch rabbi, Shlomo Karlbach, were significant, I think the most significant neo-Hasidic figures in North America after Heschel, and in different ways, um, through different means, began to articulate the need for a kind of spiritual revival, uh, a post-war, post-Holocaust spiritual revival, and um, both had great intimacy <laughs> in terms of Hasidism, but they and Arthur Green and now many other people felt and feel like they couldn't live exclusively within what the rabbis would describe as the four L's, <laughs> the four cubits <laughs> of you know traditional Hasidism. And so uh, there are many of us now that study Hasidic texts, whether it's the sermons of the Hasidic Rebbes or the stories told about those Rebbes, who um, daven in ways that are inspired by the traditions of Hasidism, but who stand outside of traditional Hasidic communities. I should also add that, you know, one of the great stories of Jewish history is the fact that Hasidism still exists and actually thrives because the Hasidic community of Eastern Europe was decimated during the Second World War and the Holocaust. And many of the dynasties that we now identify as being the strongest, the largest, the most powerful, including Chabad Lubavitch, really rose from the ashes. And while I am certainly not a part of that world, and have some strong disagreements with the ways in which right, various traditional Hasidim continue to express their Hasidic commitments, nonetheless, you know, um, to observe the ways in which those communities reestablish themselves is quite awesome. Yeah. No, thank you for 
the kind of historical background. And now to maybe ask a more pointed question, I'm curious for yeah. both you or in Unitunnel, what does it mean for you personally to be a neo-Hasid? How do you understand mm-hmm. yourselves as Hasidim? Just for context, I feel like we've been talking about Reb Zalman, and I don't think we have named yet that I'm here sitting with Natanel and Orr, who are two very senior students of Reb Zalman. So <laughs> we're getting very much the kind of inner disciple talk. So if we've been overly focused, yes. <laughs> you have to apologize. You have to forgive us as Reb Zalman is a kind of spiritual father to Natanel and Orr and a spiritual grandfather to myself. And so we can geek out <laughs> on on this endlessly, I think. And so we hope it's interesting. But yes, please, to the question of what does that neo mean for you and Hasidism? Right. Yeah. Sure. Well, I I was blessed, as I said before, by being raised in a home in which my parents, who were spiritual seekers, both coming from secular Jewish homes themselves, discovered Hasidism, you know, in writing and in the embodied presences of people like Heschel and Reb Zalman. And so it really does feel like I am a part of a chain of transmission. And that involved, you know, interesting kind of patchwork, (laughs) spiritual sensibilities and commitments. So I would say that song and dance and storytelling and the celebration of the Jewish liturgical calendar in its fullness, including Shabbat, the Sabbath, and Chagim holidays, were all a part of my upbringing. And um, I understood from a very young age that this emphasis on joy was something that was distinctively Hasidic. And joy is not a kind of resort to you know, a Pollyannish approach to life, but it became an orienting device through which to walk through the muck of life as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I was, I was told from a young age that the gift of Shabbat, the gift of the holidays were ways to cultivate a certain kind of gratitude, despite the fact that life could be difficult in some circumstances, very difficult. And that comes from Hasidism and from neo-Hasidic teachers like the ones we've mentioned. At the same time, part of the neo in Hasidism is that my parents and their teachers in their explorations of Hasidism also felt like they had no choice but to engage other forms of world wisdom. And I think that they felt that that was what God wanted and needed of them. And that's quite different than the traditional worlds of Hasidism, in which people oftentimes do not engage the wisdom of other religious traditions or of secular life, but engage more instrumentally, as is needed in modernity, but doing so with serious reservations about Mm -hmm. the the temptations and the potential downfall that one can experience if they engage too often and too deeply in modern culture. Again, it goes back to Reb Zalman's statement as a still young Hasidic rabbi about anchor chains. It's interesting to go back to Reb Zalman for a moment. You know, one of these beautiful reflective moments that Natanel and I unearthed in putting together a volume of Reb Zalman's teachings is a statement in which he says, I've been a chassid now for over 50 years, but I'm not the same chassid I was 50 years ago or 30 years ago. And that to me is a part of the spiritual evolution that is quintessentially a part of the neo-Hasidic world that I have grown up in. And just to be a little more specific before I hand the mic to Natanel, for me, one of the key lessons, again, that Reb Zalman embodied is that he 
truly embraced wisdom and beauty and truth wherever it appeared. And so it was quite uncommon, obviously, for a traditional chassid to make themselves a disciple to a Howard Thurman or a Chavrusa or a peer to a Thomas Merton. And that requires a worldview in which you would say, using classical Hasidic language, God's glory fills the whole earth, and there are sparks of divinity everywhere, and interreligious and cross-cultural engagement is not a zero-sum game. And Zalman articulated that, I think, in a way that was profound and was willing to take risks that most people were not willing to take. And to me, that's an important part of this neo-Hasidic ethos. Since, or you mentioned the book that you and Natano worked on together, I just want to plug that. Um, it's a Re- Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi Essential Teachings, and it's a part of the Modern Spiritual Masters series from Orbis Books. So if you'd like to check that out, we'll put a link to it in the show notes along with the book of Howard Thurman we were mentioning earlier. But please, Natano. So it's a bit of a complicated question for me to answer, not because it's complicated inside me, but because it's there's complexities in in the world of Hasidism and and those who participate in it, and lots of misunderstandings are possible. So let me just say, I, I grew up in a very different environment than Or. I did not grow up knowing that I was Jewish. I'm from a Mexican American family, and part of the legacy of that Mexican American family was a learning that we uh, we were crypto Jews, and that revelation, and I'll call it that because it came to me like that, it was a revelatory moment of learning that I was Jewish and impacted me in a way that felt significant. That stimulated an internal exploration and journey um, into the world of spirituality different from the one that I was then pursuing. And it became profoundly important to me to understand what it meant to be Jewish and to explore that, which ultimately led me to Reb Zalman. But even prior to uh, meeting or knowing about Reb Zalman <laughs> was an encounter with Hasidism through a little book of Martin Buber's called The Legend of the Baal Shem. And um, that book also hit me like a revelation. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily recommend it. It won't necessarily hit somebody else the same way. But I remember the first lines that I read in that book. Hit lahavut is the burning, the ardor of ecstasy. And something about that just electrified my entire being. And whatever that was talking about, I'm not even sure I understood the sentence. (laughs) But whatever that was talking about had uh, the mark of truth on it and wanted to be explored. Like some part of me understood what that was. And... So, you know, whatever that opened up in me eventually led to meeting Reb Zalman. And from one perspective, I don't want to qualify myself as neo-Hasidic. I remember I once kind of inadvertently said to Reb Zalman, in this very office in which I'm sitting, I was asking him something about the past, and I said something, and I didn't even mean this, you know, was, you know back when you were a Hasid. I don't think I said quite that. But I said something that implied that, and he got a hurt look on his face. <laughs> mm. Yes. Because for him, there was no back when I was a chassid. The whole life was an attempt to be a chassid. Yeah. And from that perspective, I don't want to qualify it at all with a neo. I was in a relationship with chassidut, with chassidism, uh, from the moment I had that experience. I certainly oriented myself to Reb Zalman like a chassid, his chassid, and him as my Rebbe. Mm. I loved him as such. I drank everything that we were in discussion about in with fervor. I was attempting to live my life oriented to um, that fervor and those teachings. Mm. And yet... I don't want to um, claim to represent Hasidism 
in the face of those many people who live it in a way that they consider authentic and according to the tradition and according to wearing the traditional clothes and according to uh, living that Hasidism as as fully committed Jews, and I mean fully committed to the mitzvot, in a way that I am not. You know, I'm alternative in a ways that they might find um, distasteful. And I, I, I want to honor the way they live it. Um, so I will qualify it with Neo in order to not cause a confusion with them, for them. But internally, it's really important to me. Yeah. I feel like I was cooked in that oven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and in what ways am I Hasidic? Uh, you know, it's, it's complicated to talk about. Because, you know, most of my life today is as an interspiritual teacher and as a Sufi teacher. But I think that people that know Hasidut would recognize how it expresses through the, these things that I do in those two worlds. Mm -hmm. That it's, a, for me, very much about kavana, a profound intentionality. As the, the Holy Baal Shem Tov spoke about being able to um, invest, that's the kavana, uh, one's entire being into a moment, that this is possible. And I struggled to do that, but I aspire to do that. And so much of my spirituality is um, challenged by that. And not just my spirituality, you know, if you think of that in a limited way, but my entire life. Like, I want to be able to put my entire being into a kiss, into writing the best sentence, <laughs> or being present to someone. I consider that Hasidism, the, the aspirationally uh, Hasidic. <laughs> so, you know, that's, you know, those are some of the, the aspects of how I consider myself neo Hasidic, uh, the qualifier for others. <laughs> <laughs> is there for others, out of respect, too. Um, but essentially for me, uh, there's, there's only chassidut. It is what it is. It is not itself qualified. You know, thank you for that. I appreciate it's not necessarily an easy question to answer for either of you and is fraught in some ways with some landmines, so to speak, in terms of <laughs> how we talk about these things and the and the trickiness that is involved. And I think, Natanel, you really answered the next question that I wanted to ask. So I'd like to kind of skip it, but I just wanted to name it because it's a deep question for myself, which is, are we involved in talking about Hasidism or are we pursuing a Hasidic endeavor? Are we ourselves Hasidim or are we merely inspired by Hasidim. And I think Natanel, in your answer, your question was a resounding yes to we are pursuing a Hasidic endeavor. And if we're not pursuing a Hasidic endeavor, it's not Hasidism. And what I hear in your answer is that kind of a claim that there's something more essential than certain kinds of externalities that would make one's Hasidism quote unquote real. And that it really has to do with that level of kavana and the heart. And yet, it's very tricky, right? Because we can't disown or disregard um, the kind of cultural elements or anything to that regard. So it kind of leads to this next question, which I think will unfortunately probably have to be our last. But I want to kind of hone in because what I was just speaking about in terms of your answer in a tunnel displays a kind of universal understanding of Hasidism or an essentialist understanding of Hasidism. And yet, within the Hasidic teachings themselves, there seems to be a pretty strong tension between universal teachings and things that are highly particularist and ethnocentric. So on the one hand, we have teachings such as the one that you named earlier, or the whole world being filled with sparks of divinity. The whole world is full of your glory. And yet we have teachings about Jewish souls. And so 
a concept that, you know, I summarily dismiss. It feels completely not resonant with, you know, my own experience of a soul, right? But I'm curious if you, either of you, can speak to this tension between universalism and particularism and with an eye towards, is there a possibility for Hasidic teachings and even Hasidic practices to not only be relevant to Jews outside of Hasidic dynasties, which is really what you were talking about, or people practicing outside of strictly Hasidic communities, but even outside of Jewish communities, and the potential for non-Jews to potentially benefit from Hasidic teachings or practice as the kind of inverse to what we've seen in America, especially in the 60s and 70s, which is a flooding of the religious ranks of other religions with Jewish leaders. Reb Zalman famously talked about being on an interreligious dialogue panel where there were about five different traditions represented and every single person was ethnically Jewish. And so if there's been this kind of migration, the question is, could there be a future in which there are significant numbers of non-Jewish Hasidic practitioners on the extreme end of a vision? I know that was a lot, but that I'm curious, so curious about this kind of soup of tension. So I'm happy to start the last round and say the following in breaking apart your question. Many classical Hasidic texts speak on the one hand about God's presence throughout all of life, that God's indwelling presence animates everyone and everything moment to moment. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, everything is coursing with divinity. And on the other hand, that Jewish and non-Jewish souls are different fundamentally, ontologically. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is a dichotomy that I can't accept. It simply is not a part of my theological worldview. I don't think or feel or experience that Jews, whether born into Judaism or who convert to Judaism, have souls that emanate from one plane of existence and non-Jewish souls emanate from a plane of existence beneath that. So that kind of hierarchical soul talk is something that I feel compelled to reject. And I also understand that the founders of Hasidism and many a Chosid found themselves living in a world in which they were told daily, weekly, monthly, in different ways, including through the use of violent force, that they were lesser than. And so this kind of soul talk is a coded cry and retort to many people that found that they had limited power and limited agency and were yearning for redemption. And so the answer became in this topsy-turvy world in which we are seen as weak, as superseded, is outmoded, as unloved, the opposite is actually true. Mm -hmm. And that was a kind of very sad, I would say tragic kind of strategy for people that felt themselves to be profoundly wounded and often powerless. But here we are, anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism have not disappeared, but we have much more power and access than most of our forebears could have ever imagined. And so I think it's also important to state out loud that we disagree with those kinds of statements about Jewish triumphalism, mm -hmm. because there are too many people that read the texts of the Hasidic masters or of medieval mystics or of other Jewish sages and understand those 
expressions as a justification for attitudes and behaviors that I think are abhorrent. So that's a complicated kind of exegetical, historical, and spiritual exercise, but one that's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Because unless we're honest about, you know, continuities and disruptions with Hasidic and other classical Jewish voices, then we can't be engaged in a project of renewal. Because, you know, you need to see the lines of continuity and, you know, the cracks in the, in the edifice in order to go about the work of what we call tikkun, of mending and healing and so forth and so on. I'm going to pause there because I think that that's, that's an important part of this uh, work. And I want to invite Nathaniel, you know, to comment on one or more of the other aspects of your question. And I have one more thing to say about universality and particularity as a learning from Reb Zalman, you know, in the, in the unfolding of Hasidism or Neo-Hasidim, or as Nathaniel and Reb Zalman described it, um, this latest turn of the Hasidic well, I'm grateful you went first um, because um, you, who um, who live more th- more fully within the Jewish world, disclaiming those teachings is more significant than me disclaiming those teachings about you know the superiority of a Jewish soul. You know, if it's talked about that way, it's less significant for me <laughs> to say something about that. But it also allows me to say that. That Reb Zalman, my teacher, uh, was had a mission, as he understood it, to preserve the tradition of Judaism, and not only preserve it, but preserve its vitality, its living essence, that it should not uh, disappear or be diminished, but be enhanced by a reinvestment in its own functionality. And there's a way in which Reb Zalman was very much a a New England pr- pragmatist, <laughs> thinking in terms of like uh, looking at halakha, you know, Jewish law, and how did it function for us? And how can it function for us better today if we understood its functionality? And so mm-hmm. that project of renewal was very important to him, and I want to honor it even if I don't represent it. I also want to say that while it may not feel good for us to uh, to talk about you know a Jewish soul and a non-Jewish soul in a way that creates a hierarchy. I wouldn't want to lose complexity in that discussion either. There is something, and this may be able you know people may be able to say this for other traditions as well. But Judaism has a claim on many Jews, even when one tries to run and hide from it, reject it. <laughs> the the claim obtains <laughs> it remains and and people find themselves in some sort of relationship too even if it's a negative relationship mm-hmm. escaping the relationship becomes very difficult and and I can't exclude myself from that claim because I did not experience learning that I was Jewish or had some Jewish ancestry as a curiosity I experienced it as a claim and as as something necessary to explore to honor my ancestors who were oppressed i felt that and i and i felt i had an inner experience that demanded to be explored and even if it's not my life to represent judaism now it was a necessity for me to explore my relationship to it and so what is that so we may not like the language, uh, you know, the hierarchical language of a Jewish soul, but it doesn't mean that there isn't complexity of relationship and genetic inheritance and soul history and all these possibilities in an infinite universe, you know, an infinitely complex universe. That's very possible and has nothing to do with a kind of hierarchical relationship. I think, Nathaniel, this might be, you know, the place to introduce Reb Zalman's notion of Go right ahead. you know the organism yeah right that there is an organismic possibility that feels particularly appropriate for the paradigm or the age or the epoch in which we live which is to say as Reb Zalman did that 
we are a part of something that is larger than any religious or cultural tradition, and it is a living organism. <laughs> it is life itself. And sometimes he liked to talk about that as the body of the divine, right? Which is creation in its fullness. And that each culture and each religion, you know, constitute a different organ or limb of the body. And so in order for there to be healthy functioning, each community needs to function healthfully. And that does mean that there is complexity. It does mean that there is particularity. But it also means, as he famously said, that we need to share vital nutrients. And so I very much identify you know, with the notion that we have to be semi-permeable. If we want to belong to a community, if we want to invest, as you said before, in a tradition, it requires depth work. And that kind of depth work involves specificity. And so there are a variety of ways in which people can articulate similarities and differences. And Daniel, I really like the way in which you opened your question, <laughs> your multi-pronged question, by saying, um, we need to hold the tension. And I think for, for, for many of us, that's very difficult. How can I walk through the world at once and say, I know it to be true that we are similar and different. And unless we hold that, we run the risk of a world which becomes either you know, tyrannical by you know, the, the force of one hegemonic power over the other, or a world in which, as Abraham Joshua Heschel said, it would be like walking into you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and finding that every picture frame contains <laughs> the same painting, <laughs> right. which ironically or paradoxically would also lead to a kind of violent hegemonic reality. And Rem Salman was very, you know, was very concerned about that. And I am too. And it doesn't mean that all of us need to be only one thing at a time. But I, for example, feel called to live this life as a Jew, mm -hmm. to live this life as a person that's dedicated to studying and practicing and teaching uh, the traditions of Judaism as thoughtfully as possible and being in ongoing dialogue with people um, who are doing the same in Christian and Buddhist and Hindu in secular humanist agnostic traditions and people like Nitanel and a growing number of people who find that they are a part of more than one community and learning, you know, how they are attempting to move from their is to their ought. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's a part of this, you know, organismic sensibility. But I do feel called to be a part of this shalshelet, as it's called classically, this, this chain of tradition or transmission, and aspiring, as you said so beautifully, Netanel, to, to live it as a chassid, <laughs> whether it's a neo-chassid, or a Paleolithic chassid, as <laughs> one of my friends quipped, you know, when we were talking about, you know, the gradations of chassidism and how to identify ourselves over against or in relationship to. Yeah. But language does matter, you know, and, and so we're we're trying we're trying to speak our truths, knowing that none of us has hold of absolute truth. Yeah. Thank you. And. In that context, like we don't have claim to the whole truth, and also nobody is the kind of steward of any one tradition in its entirety. And so then there raises a question of, in as much as you're doing Hasidic teaching or writing about Hasidism, like what are you representing? What do you have a right, depending on your location, in terms of yeah, what right do you have to share something, et cetera? And you know, I'm coming with my own background that makes a lot of these questions juicy and 
I feel like I need to apologize to both of you and to our listeners more than maybe any other episode before. I feel like I just went around like opening cans of worms and not closing them. <laughs> so I feel like now we're just like, I've like opened Pandora's box in numerous directions and just want to um, absolve both of you of any responsibility <laughs> in terms of I was asking a lot of very tricky questions, nuanced that require really nuanced responses that we maybe didn't have the time for. And also understanding that Hasidism generally is not a well understood thing. And so it is a bit difficult to have a kind of in-depth conversation about these topics while also trying to introduce other things. But for what it's worth, I hope it was valuable and at least interesting. And I know we do need to close at this point. And so I'm wondering, or if you could close us out in typical Hasidic fashion with a little nigun or melody. I am not one to grant absolution. <laughs> that's that's not a part of my chain of transmission. Um, but Daniel, I just want to thank you um, for inviting us into a very rich conversation that is complicated and is unfinished. And, you know, the two of you can also edit as is necessary and we can do part two part three part five part six uh (laughs) as as we desire uh and more importantly continue the conversation because because having conversation partners is itself a blessing so i I really don't want to overlook that so i want to thank you uh you know in, in, in a fulsome fulsome way and here is my uh here's my closing nigun i don't know exactly where it's coming up or down from, but uh, this is what strikes me as my teenage daughter and her friends are are waiting to reclaim (laughs) this space uh, (laughs) as, as her goofy dad is, is is going to sing his way to the end of this podcast. (laughs) (sighs) Ah, la, la. La 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 you, thank you, thank thank you. you la Thank you. So long. Shout out to friend of the show, Tree Fort of Golden Turtle Sound, for producing the intro and outro music and assisting with mixing and mastering. Be sure to check out his awesome music and hit up Golden Turtle Sound for any of your audio engineering needs.